All right, let's go ahead and get started. This is the uh, review session for the uh, fall 2011 final exam, and we're going to be doing the uh, last semester, spring 2011 final exam. And for you guys that don't know, my name is uh, Dr. John R. Taylor. I've got several different kinds of students in here. We got uh, my class, Math 1241, my engineering class, engineering calculus 1241. I believe uh, a couple of sections of Desiree's classes are in here. And then we got some uh, welcome guests as well from other classes because they heard about this thing and just wanted to show up. So, um, uh, and because in my classes, I went ahead and started this uh, review session for them on the last day of class. Uh, I'm going to start this thing all over again just like it's complete fresh and give you guys some hints and some strategies on how to do the exam. All right, so tomorrow, Friday, you uh, the exam will officially start at 8 o'clock. You'll be given the, uh, the exam booklet. And the first part of the exam booklet is the no calculator section. So right at this time, we're not allowed to use the calculators. And you do not get to use calculators for the first hour of this exam. Now, if everybody had turned in their uh, part ones and you get the part twos and part threes, which is uh, the parts with the calculator, part one is the multiple choice no calculator. Part two is the multiple choice with the calculator. Part three is free response with the calculator. So you typically, you do part one, and once you're done with part one, you will turn it in, and then you will be working on part two and part three. But you still don't get to use your calculator until everybody has turned in part one or nine o'clock shows up, whichever one comes first. All right. Then you will be given the official word in your respective classes that you can use your calculator and then you get to break it out. But not until then. Even though you're working on part two and part three, if it's still in the no calculator time zone, you still don't get to touch a calculator. But you'll see that most of the problems anyway, you don't have to use a calculator anyway. It's only on those major intense calculating a final answer type thing here. And you can do most of the problem even then without a calculator. All right, so here we go. This is the, uh, like I said, the spring 2011 semester's exam, part one, no calculator. You don't forget your number two uh, pencil that you have to have, and I suggest you bring several of these things. And here we go. And like I said, uh, for my classes, I've already done this part one, but I'm going to do it again afresh for everyone. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to see it, you get to see me do every problem on this thing. The first problem is this. Let h of x be equal to x squared plus one quantity cubed. Evaluate h prime of one. You know this first part. If they're going to give you no calculator, what, are, what is the major idea behind calculus number one? So what kind of questions are you anticipating, especially on this first section? Derivatives. This is what calculus one is all about. Take derivative, take derivative, take derivative. And a little application. This one, they want me to take derivative and then uh, plug in one. So if you can plug in a number, even though you don't have your calculator, they're typically going to be right, nice numbers to play with. All right? So this first guy here is this h prime of x would be equal to, I would use the chain rule on this guy, drew the outside, inside stays the same, time drew the inside, so it would be 3 times x squared plus 1 quantity squared, time drew the inside, which is 2x. And then from there, I'm going to plug in 1 into my derivative, 3 times 1 squared plus 1 quantity squared times 2 times 1. Just remember, order of operations, inside parentheses first, 1 squared is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, so this becomes 3 times 2 squared, and 3 times 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4, 3 times 4 is 12, times 2 is 24, the answer is D. Okay? Again, you need to be practicing these guys, product rule, chain rule, quotient rule, and don't forget those wonderful derivatives of trig functions here. So, here we go, number 2. I'm going to take the derivative, and this time they just want me to find the derivative. But a lot of these derivatives you're going to find, sometimes they're going to make you guys clean it up. So remember, 60% of calculus is still algebra, so taking derivative is typically not too hard as long as you've got the formulas memorized. However, that being said, uh, you will have to clean it up and find your answer. Take your time is the key to this thing. Most people will screw this, up, screw this exam up by rushing through it. They get the answer, and then they're, they're, they're trying to go to the next problem so quickly, and they were not paying attention to the answers, and they actually circle or bubble in the wrong guy. Just take your time. you got three hours. you got no place to go. Enjoy this thing. All right. So, <laughs> chain rule. We drew the sign. What's drew the sign? 
cosine. Chain rule, inside stays the same, the angle stays the same time. Drew the inside, which is times two. And notice you typically, with this type of trig function, you always put your constants out front, so this is two cosine of two x, which happens to be answer E. Straight up. You have an hour to do part one, but most folks are done with part one in about 30 to 40 minutes. And that's even by going over it again, which you should all do. Especially the guys in my class, I've seen your grades, and I know most of your problems are careless errors. Not understand. It's not understanding the material, it's the idea of making stupid mistakes. You know, 2 times 2, 22, and then run that answer through something or other. So take your time on this stuff. All right. Number three, f of x equals 3x squared times the natural log of 3x. And again, another one of these, evaluate the derivative, to find f prime at 1. So what I'm going to do here is I've got... 3x squared times the natural log of 3x. So what rule should I use? Product rule. Drew the first times the second plus the first times drew the second. So drew the first, 6x times the second, natural log of 3x plus the first, 3x squared times drew the second. Drew the natural log of 3x. Well, this is natural log of a function. That's chain rule. Drew the natural log of a function is 1 over the function times drew the function. This is what they're really testing you guys on. So that would be 1 over 3x times drew the inside, which is 3. Cleaning this guy up just before I plug my numbers in. These 3's end up canceling. x squared divided by x just makes an x on the top. So this becomes 6x natural log of 3x plus 3x. Take your time. Don't make careless errors. And then I'm supposed to find f prime of 1. Again, even though it's a no calculator section, you will be have to crunch a few numbers on this, but they're usually dice numbers. So this will be 6 times 1 times the natural log of 3 times 1 plus 3 times 1. I'm trying not to skip any steps, so when you go back and look at these recordings and stuff, you can go, oh, okay, this is what he did. So uh, 6 times 1 is obviously 6. Natural log of 3 times 1 is 3 plus 3. And now I've got to go figure out which answer this guy is. And, of course, they're going to write it in a different order, but that's just life. It's a plus, so it doesn't matter. So the answer is C. Does that make sense? Take a look at this next guy. Let me blow it up a little bit. There we go. F of X equals X divided by X squared minus X plus 1. And it says what? What a surprise. Part one, take a derivative. This is calculus one, take a derivative of everybody. If you're not, you are not happy in this course until you take a derivative of somebody. Remember that on the final exam. So uh, here's the deal. What rule will I use? Quotient rule. Drew the top times the bottom minus the top times the bottom all over the bottom square. Drew the top, one, times the bottom, x squared minus x plus one, minus the top, x times the bottom, which is two x minus one, all over the bottom, square. Now we typically want to clean this guy up. So this is equal to <coughs> x squared minus x plus 1 minus, I'm going to distribute the x here, minus 2x squared plus x. All over x squared minus x plus 1 squared. Cleaning this guy up. So I get my derivative to be equal to x squared minus 2x squared that gives me negative x squared. Minus x plus x cancels, plus 1, divided by x squared minus x plus 1 quantity squared. Now I've got to figure out which one of these guys is my answer. Well, of course, again, it never is the right, the right way that you write wrote it down. Sometimes it is, but mostly it's not. But remember, x squared, um, negative x squared plus 1 is the same thing as 1 minus x squared, which would be answer... Also, I want to point this thing out to everybody. Again, strategies on studying for and, and doing the final exam and doing well on the final exam. Strategies on this thing is very simple. Look at this thing. Even before I even cleaned it up, I got this x squared minus x plus 1 quantity squared in the denominator. There's only three answers to actually have that x squared minus x plus 1 quantity squared in the denominator. I knew it had to either be C, D, or E. So even when you're doing some of these problems and you're having some kind of issue or some, some reason, you can at least on the multiple choice narrow it down to a fewer options. Because so, usually a couple of the options are actually kind of stupid. Okay, so 
Then they narrow down to whether you know the sign, like especially with trig functions. They love to give you the same trig function. One's positive, one negative. So you got to make sure you know your derivative of your trig functions and stuff. All right. Take a look at number five. Let f of x be equal to the square root of x squared minus 2x. The derivative is, what a surprise. But I don't do square roots. What's a square root? <coughs> half power. So that's x squared minus 2x raised to the 1 half. So what rule will I use to take the root of this guy? Chain rule. Drew the outside, inside stays the same, raised to the negative one half. Time drew the inside, which is 2x minus 2. This problem right here, I uh, believe it or not, bothered a lot of students from last semester. Because they get down to this answer right here. But what did they, the people, the writers of our exam, what did they end up doing to this particular problem? They cleaned it up. And they couldn't figure out how to go from here to here, and they picked out the wrong guy. Well, let's go through the math here. Negative exponent goes where? And a half a power is what kind? Square root. So that would be a square root on the bottom. The 2 is already on the bottom, so that's 2. And that would be a square root of x squared minus 2x all on the bottom. And the 2x minus 2 stays in the numerator. You will notice that you have a 2 in common, but the only way you can cancel a fraction, numerator denominator, is through strict multiplication division. So I have to factor out the 2 out of the numerator. It gives me x minus 1 divided by 2 square roots of x squared minus 2x. And then the 2's end up canceling, leaving you with the final answer of x minus 1 divided by the square root of x squared minus 2x, which is answer... It's D. Again, take your time and figure out which one it is. Does that make sense? Questions? All right, keep going. <coughs> you know they're going to throw a little quote-unquote physics application, you guys, and here's one right here. A particle moves along a straight line. Its position at time t is given by the equation s of t equals e to the e raised to the 3t. What is the acceleration of the particle when t equals 1? So again, they're testing you on your ability to take derivatives, of course, but they're also testing you guys on your ability to understand the physical concepts. Position is your function. Velocity is what? First derivative. Acceleration is the second derivative. So what they really want me to do is take the second derivative and stick in 1. Great. All right. So here's my position function. This is e to the 3t, e to a function. So when I take derivative of it, it's the chain rule version of it. Derivative e to a function is e to the function times the derivative of the exponent. So this would be e to the 3t times the derivative of the exponent, which is 3. That would be the velocity if you were thinking about physics. Why? <laughs> that would be the velocity equation. I'm going to clean it up a little bit. That's 3 e to the 3t. Now the acceleration, which is the second derivative, with 3 is a constant, leave it your own. It, the derivative of e to the 3t is e to the 3t uh, times e to the x minus 3, which gives me 9e to the 3t. But that's not my answer. What do they want me to do with this thing? Plug in 1. They want the acceleration at 1, which is the second derivative evaluated at 1, which would be 9e to the 3 times 1, which is pretty much 9e cubed. And that would be answer D again. Does that make sense? All right. Number seven. You and I both know that this problem is going to show up in your exam at least two or three times. They love to always ask a question, calculus one, find the equation of the tangent line. And here we are again. Let f of x be equal to 24 over x. Find the equation of the tangent line to the graph y equals f of x at the point 2, 12. Anytime you need to find the equation of a line, what do you got to use? Point slope. Every time. Point slope. Gets you started. The point slope formula is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. But we want the equation of a tangent line. So we got, look what they gave us here. It's awfully nice of them. They gave me the point, got that down, 212. But I need the slope. And you have been programmed personally by me. Anytime you need the slope of the tangent line, what are you going to do? Take a derivative. So my function is f of x equals 24 divided by x. Now if I want to take the root of this guy, I could use the quotient rule if you really wanted me to. But never forget John's fundamental calculus. What's John's fundamental calculus? 
Clean up your algebra first. Make steak and derivatives a whole lot easier. I don't like stuff on the bottom. So that would be 24x to the negative 1. So what would my derivative be? That would be negative 24x to the negative 2. And if you clean them up, that's negative 24 over x squared. But that's the derivative. That is officially not the slope of the tangent line. That's a formula for the slope of the tangent line. I want the slope of the tangent line. What was my x value in this particular problem here? The x value is 2, so the slope of the tangent line would be f prime evaluated at 2, which would be negative 24 over 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. Negative 24 divided by 4 is negative 6. Yes, I still have to crunch a few numbers on this thing, but they're real easy numbers to do. Plugging it in. So there is my slope of my tangent line. There's my point, and now I'm going to apply it into the point-slope formula. y minus y1, which is 12, is equal to the slope, negative 6, times x minus 2. Cleaning this guy up. Typically, when I'm looking at my answers, they solve every one of them for y, so I'm going to solve this thing for y, so I'm going to distribute the negative 6 first. Moving this way, my minus 12 equals negative 6x plus 12. Then I add 12 to both sides, making watching the, for the careless error. That gives me negative, y equals negative 6x plus 24. And there's my answer, which must be answer D again. Does that make sense? But we got to create new and better ways to throw questions at you guys. If we go through the same questions every time, well, that exam just won't be very exciting for you. So take a look at the next problem. It's the same question. They just reworded it slightly, but it's the same concept. Take a look at number 8. Suppose that the line with the equation 2x minus 6y plus 16 equals 0. Is the tangent line to the graph y equals f of x at the point 1, 3? Then you're supposed to tell them what f prime of 1 equals. Well, a lot of people messed this problem up because they didn't understand what the question was asking. They just want to take it rid of somebody and stick in 1. But this is uh, one of those theoretical questions. The theory is that's the equation of a tangent line at the point 1, 3. What's the x coordinate? 1. They want to know what the derivative at 1 is. Well, the derivative when you're talking about equation of tangent lines is the slope of the tangent line. So all I've got to do this equation is figure out what the slope is. So I'm going to turn this thing into y equals mx plus b, the old slope intercept form. And I can read what the slope is, which would be the derivative evaluated at 1. So I have here 2x minus 6y plus 16 equals 0. All right, I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides. I'm going to subtract 16 from both sides. Just trying to solve for y here. That gives me negative 6y equals negative 2x minus 16. I'm going to divide both sides by negative 6. And remember, what I do to one side, I do to the other. What I do to one term, I do to all terms in my equation. This cancels here, leaving me with y equals negative 2 divided by negative 6 is 1 third x. Uh, negative 16 divided by negative 6 would be a plus uh, 8 thirds. But remember, the derivative evaluated at 1, since my point was 1, is the same as the slope of the tangent line. And what's the slope of this line? 1 third, the number in front of the x, 1 third. So the answer is C in this problem. But it's the same style question. They're just trying to turn it inside out but basically still asking you about equations of tangent lines, the slopes of tangent lines being the derivative. Okay. Remember your chapter one, they're going to throw a few algebra questions at you guys, and here's one. Let uh, f of x be equal to 2x squared minus x plus 1 divided by 3, excuse me, uh, x cubed plus x. Find all vertical and horizontal asymptotes. All right, so what you need to do to find a vertical asymptote is you look at your equation, and my equation again is f of x is equal to 2x squared minus x plus 1 divided by x cubed plus x. I could factor out an x out of this guy. That would give me x times uh, x squared plus 1. I'll do that in a second. And 2x squared minus x plus 1, I, I could try to factor that. I always want to reduce these guys. So if they factor, maybe one of the terms cancel. You always want to reduce this thing if it cancels. But this guy doesn't factor. Because there's no way to get a plus 1, and i got a 2x squared to get a negative x in the middle of this thing. So the thing doesn't factor, so I know this is in reduced form. So anytime you need to find the vertical asymptote, 
after you try to reduce it is you set the denominator. Set the deno equal to zero. What's my denominator? x cubed plus x. Set it equal to zero. I'm going to factor out the x out of it. That's going to give me an x squared plus one equals zero. I set each factor equal to zero, so one of my answers is x equals zero. I set the other factor, x squared plus one equals zero. This gives me x squared equals negative one. I take the square root of both sides, but in real mathematics, looking for real numbers, what is the square root of negative one? Doesn't exist. It's the i number, imaginary number i, but in our case, it D and E's. So I don't get a, Z, a, a vertical isotope on this part, but I do get one here. So the answer is x equals zero which tells me the answer is now either C or D. So now I have to move on and get the horizontal isomptote. How do you get the horizontal isomptote? Well, you can either remember the old college algebra, high school algebra two way about the degree of the numerator versus degree of the denominator. <coughs> Works like this. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, Y equals zero is the horizontal isomptote. If the degree of the numerator equals the degree of the denominator, then it's the y equals the ratio of the leading coefficients is the horizontal isomptote. And if the denominator is bigger than the numerator, you have something called a slant isomptote. But that's college algebra. We're in calculus. So to do one in calculus, what we do is we take the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x squared minus x plus 1 over x cubed plus x. And if I throw in my infinity into this thing, I get the classic infinity over infinity, which means what rule will I have to use because we just love it here? L'Hopital's rule. And what is L'Hopital's rule? You take the root of the top over the root of the bottom. The root of the top would be 4x minus 1. Over the root of the bottom, which is 3x squared plus 1. And notice when I plug it in, I get the same thing again. Plugging in infinity. 4 times infinity is infinity. Minus 1 is still infinity. Infinity squared times 3 plus 1 is still infinity. So I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule. L apostrophe H. L'Hopital's rule one more time on this guy. And this is going to give me... 4 over 6x. Now plug in infinity. 6 times infinity is infinity. 4 divided by infinity. But when the infinity is in the denominator, what's my answer? 0. And when you talk about horizontal isomptotes, it's always y equals. So it is y equals 0 is the horizontal isomptote. Does that make sense? And again, I'm applying the calculus trying to teach you guys some stuff here. So which one of these guys is going to be my answer? Well, let's see here. It's either D or C with X equals zero, so it's got to be C because the horizontal isomptote is Y equals zero. Answer is C. Does that make sense? All right, take a look at the next guy. But I've got to remind myself, you know, notice one thing. Well, as I'm doing these problems, I am not using a calculator at all. So here's one that uh, really messed up some students because they felt like they should have had their calculators, but you don't need it. Let me show you. Suppose the derivative of a function f is given by f prime, and I wrote on top of it. This is f prime of x is equal to x squared times x minus 1 times x minus 2 quantity cubed. All right? Which uh, critical numbers give relative max or relative mins? I want to know which guys are going to be relative max or relative min. Well, what I'm going to do is what we call the first derivative test. For a relative max, to get a maximum, I have my derivative, I'm going to talk about increasing and decreasing. I've got to go up and then come down to be a maximum. To be a minimum, I go down, negative derivative, and then I go back up again, positive. So I go from negative to positive as a minimum. I go from positive to negative as a maximum. So I've got to figure out the intervals of increase and decrease. But before I do all that stuff, I've got to find my critical points. My derivative was given by x squared times x minus 1 times x minus 2 cubed. We set that sucker equal to zero. This is how you find a critical point. Critical point is where the derivative is equal to zero or the derivative doesn't exist at. Now, I'm solving this guy. I set each factor equal to zero. x squared equals zero. x minus one equals zero. And x minus two cubed is equal to zero. Take the square root of both sides here. I get x equals zero is one critical point. Add one. x equals one is another critical point. And then I'm going to take the cube root of both sides here. This gives me x minus 2, cube root of 0 is 0, add 2, I get x equals 2. So pretty much 0, 1, 2, we're, we're, not, we're not very exciting in mathematics here in terms of my numbers. All right? So, let's see now. What I'm going to do here to figure out which one is the uh, uh, max and min, I'm going to do what I call 
the first derivative test, I'm going to find in my intervals of increase and decrease. I put my critical numbers on my number line, 0, 1, and 2. And I'm going to do test values. I'm going to plug test values into my derivative. But I remind you, my derivative was given. So I want to pick a number less than 0. I choose negative 1. But here's the thing. I don't have a calculator for this problem. You don't need one. Use your brain. Plugging in negative 1. Don't care about the number. It's a negative number, right? Negative 1. Negative 1 squared. What do you got? You get positive 1. So that's just positive there. What is negative 1 minus 1? Well, that's negative 2, but that's negative. And negative 1 minus 3 is negative. Negative 3. And when I cube a negative, what do you get? What's a negative times a negative times a negative? Negative. So what is positive times negative times negative? Positive. If you take a negative, a positive, and multiply times a negative, and multiply that times a negative, you get positive. So in this in particular interval, I'm increasing. It's positive there. Now I'm going to pick a number between 0 and 1. Clearly, I'm going to choose 0.5, a half, and plug it in into my derivative. 0.5 squared. Well, 0.5 squared is positive. 0.5 minus 1 is negative 0.5. That's negative. 0.5 minus 2 is uh, negative 2.5. But when you take negative 2.5 and cube him, what are you going to get? Negative again. Positive times negative times negative is back to positive. So I'm positive again, which tells me that 0 is not a max min point. Does that make sense? It's a critical point, but it's not a max min point because I'm increasing and then I'm increasing some more. To be a max min point, I have to change intervals of increase and decrease. I've got to go up and then come back down, or go back down and come back up again. All right, so let's try another number. Uh, a, a test point between 1 and 2. Of course, I'm going to choose 1.5 and plug him in. 1.5 squared is positive. 1.5 minus 1 is positive. 1.5 minus 2 is negative 0.5. Negative 0.5 cubed is negative. Positive times negative times negative is negative. So everybody in this interval is negative. And pick one more point. I choose 3. 3 squared is positive. It's 9. 3 minus 1 is 2. That's positive. 3 minus 2 is 1 cubed is positive. Positive times positive times positive is big positive. So I'm back to being positive again. So in terms of understanding what's going on here, I am increasing, I'm increasing, I'm increasing some more, I'm decreasing, and I'm increasing. That tells me 1 is going to be a max point, because I go up and come back down. But since I'm going down and coming back up, it tells me 2 is a min point. But 0 is neither a max nor a min point. Does that make sense? So, on this particular problem here, which ones are max min points? And that's what, relative max or relative min? It is the answer D. Well, x equals 1 and x equals 2 only. Zero is not going to be one of these guys. Well, this part of the exam is where students typically mess up by careless error. You have to remember your formulas. The question on this particular problem is this. It's asking you to find the uh, general antiderivative of the function here. All right? Find the general antiderivative of the function f of x equals 2e raised to the x plus x squared minus 1. The reason why people mess this up is, okay, fine. 90% of this exam is going to be take derivative to somebody. That's just your calculus 1. Welcome to that. But remember, chapter 4.7, last thing we covered, we're setting you up for calculus 2, dealing with the antiderivative or the integral. So, well, to find the antiderivative or the integral of this guy, I've got to go back and know those new rules. There weren't many of them, but you have to have them memorized. What is the antiderivative of 2 uh, times e to the x? Well, what is the antiderivative of e to the x? So 2 is a constant, antiderivative e to the x is e to the x, plus what is the antiderivative of x squared? Remember, we're not taking derivative, we're taking the antiderivative. That's the add 1 over add 1 called the power rule. What's the integral of x squared? What is it? x cubed over 3, add 1 over add 1, minus what's the antiderivative of 1? 
It's not zero. That's the derivative. What's the antiderivative? X. X. And then anytime you're taking the integral, you always put plus C. So which one of these guys is my answer? It is uh, 2 e to the x plus x cubed minus x plus c. I believe the answer here is c. Take your time on picking these answers out. Does that make sense? Number 12, another problem with this, but this one is knowing the uh, logs and the trig functions here. I'm going to take the antiderivative of 3 over x plus 2 sine of x minus 3 cosine of x dx. 3 is a constant. Pull it out front. What is the antiderivative or integral of 1 over x? Natural log, absolute value of x. Pure memorization. And you can always double check yourself on this stuff by if I take the derivative, like in this last problem, if I take the derivative of this guy, I'll get the stuff back in the middle. Right? I'll get back where I came from. So when I'm done, if I take the derivative of this answer, I should get this guy back again. All right, plus 2. What is the integral antiderivative of sine of x? The derivative of sine x is cosine of x. Look for a pattern. The antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine of x. So this will be negative 2 cosine of x minus 3. What is the antiderivative or integral of cosine of x? Sine of x. The derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. So the antiderivative cosine of x is positive sine of x. And then we put a big old plus c there. And so which one of these guys is my answer? I believe the answer is c again. It's not c, 2 cosine. Oh, I forgot the 3. Oh, thank you. Uh, how about this one? Sorry about that. Uh, try the answer e. This is that careless error thing. When you're looking at these problems, sometimes they begin to look all alike after you do this exam so many times. The answer is E. I forgot I lost three there. This is a careless error thing. Be careful. Take your time on this stuff. All right, I'm going to let you guys know. You know what the difference is between me doing these problems up here and you guys doing them? I've graduated. All right, we all make mistakes. Be careful. The thing is... I've already aced this exam once. I don't have to do it again, but I'm doing it for you guys. But take your time. Be careful. Watch for the careless errors. And that, that's it. Now, like I said, this is the type of thing that I do all the time. I get the right answer, and then I can't pick it out of a lineup. So uh, be careful and do check each one. Now, you're right. I lost the three off that one. I was looking at the minus and the minus on the trig, but there's a three in front of that guy. Pick E. All right. Here's another problem, number 13. If the graph of f of x equals kx cubed minus 12x squared plus 5x plus 7 has an inflection point at x equals 2, what's the value of k? Well, again, this is a definitional thing. How do you find an inflection point? What do you do? When they say the word inflection point, what are you going to do? Second derivative. second derivative, and you set it, sucker, equal to 0. So I need to take the second derivative of this guy. So the derivative of k is a constant, leave it alone, of x cubed is uh, 3kx squared minus derivative of 12x squared is 24x. Derivative of 5x is plus 5. That's the first derivative. The second derivative is derivative of x squared is 2. Bring it down 2 times 3k. 2 times 3k is a 6kx minus derivative of 24x is 24. There's my second derivative. But they said it has an inflection point at 2. So this is telling me f double prime at 2 has to be equal to 0. You take the second derivative and set it equal to 0, but it should be as equal to 2. So f double prime at 2 is equal to 6 times k times 2 minus 24. That's equal to 0. 2 times 6k is uh, 12k, so I get 12k minus 24 equals 0. Add 24 to both sides, 12k equals a positive 24. Divide by 12, this gives me k is equal to 2. Again, look mom, no calculator. Answer is B2. Don't need a calculator for this stuff. Now, this next problem, they should not have had to tell you use L'Hopital's rule. You should have figured it out. What is the first rule of limit? First thing you should always do with a limit. Anytime you're given a limit, what are you going to do? Plug in a number. If I plug in a number, take a limit as x approaches 0, 3 raised to the, uh, sorry, e raised to the 3x minus 1 over x. If I plug in 0, this is e to the 3 times 0 
minus 1 divided by 0. 3 times 0 is 0. e to the 0 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0 over 0. What a surprise. 0 over 0. What are you going to do when you have a limit? You've got 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. L'Hopital's rule. Which will be the limit as x approaches 0. I've drew the top. Derivative of e to the 3x again is e to the 3x times 3. Derivative of minus 1 is 0. Divided by the derivative of the bottom, which is just 1. Now I replug in my number. This is e to the 3 times 0 times 3 divided by 1. 3 times 0 is 0. e to the 0 is 1 times 3 is 3 divided by 1. The answer is 3. The answer is d. Does that make sense? And the last one, number 15, setting you guys up for those related rate time of problems. This is called implicit differentiation. Let x squared times y cubed minus x plus 2y equal 2. Find dy dx at the point 1, 1. Well, since I'm reviewing you guys for the final exam, let's just find dy dx first. And I'll give you guys some clues on how to, how to hints on how to uh, make this problem a little easier. But I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. Let's find dy dx. Well, with implicit differentiation, i got y's intermixed with the x's. I can't separate them. So basically, you just jump in with both feet and start taking derivative. How do you take derivative of x squared times y cubed? That's uh, a product. So I'm going to use the product rule. Drew the first, 2x times the second, y cubed plus the first, x squared times drew the second. Drew of y cubed is 3y squared. But being implicit differentiation, you have to tack on, every time you take derivative of y, you tack on that dy dx, or y prime if you want to use that guy. Minus what's derivative of uh, x is uh, 1. Plus what's derivative of 2y is just 2, but it's a y, so you tack on a dy dx is equal to, and don't forget, the derivative of 2 is 0. Now, I'm going to solve this thing for dy dx. But honestly, if I was going to do this problem and try to go as quickly as possible, I would just go ahead, because what I'm supposed to do is find dy dx at the point 1, 1. I can plug in x is 1. I can plug in y is 1 and get a bunch of numbers here and then treat the dy dx as a variable and then solve for that variable. You can do it that way. But let's practice a little bit trying to set you up for the final exam. Uh, let's just solve for dy dx. It's good practice. To solve for dy dx, I'm going to move the terms that don't have a dy dx to the other side. So I'm going to subtract 2xy two, uh, two cubed. I'm going to add 1 also. Let's get rid of this, get rid of that gives me a 3x squared y squared dy dx plus 2 dy dx equals negative 2x times sorry, 2x times y cubed plus 1. Now I've got a dy dx here. I'm going to solve for this by factoring it out. Factoring out the dy dx leaves me with 3x squared y squared plus 2 equals negative 2x y cubed plus 1. And then I'm going to divide which gives me dy dx is equal to negative 2xy cubed plus 1 divided by 3x squared y squared plus 2. But honestly, that is not my answer. What am I supposed to do at the end of this particular problem? Plug in for x1, plug in for y1. Okay? x is 1, y is 1. So, this will give me, I'm going to write it up here so you guys can see it. As I have dy over dx equal to negative 2xy cubed plus 1 divided by 3x squared y squared plus 2, I'm going to evaluate at the point 1, 1. Evaluating at the point 1, 1 is going to give me negative 2 times 1 times 1 cubed plus 1 divided by 3 times 1 squared times 1 squared plus 2. Well, let's see here. 1 cubed is, uh, last time I checked, 1 times 1 times negative 2 is negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1 over 1 squared, 1 squared is 1, 1 times 1 is 1 times 3 is 3 plus 2 is 5. I get the answer negative 1 fifth, which is answer B. That makes sense. That'll lose you guys anywhere. All right. So you'll notice this thing. How long did it take me to do part 1? Uh, a little more than 30 minutes, and I'm a little long-winded on this one because I'm trying to give you guys some strategies. But honestly, most folks finish up part one in about 30 minutes or so, 30, 35 minutes. But being that I'm your professor and I've seen your grades, I know that you are going to screw this thing up because you cannot add, you cannot multiply, you cannot divide. You are going to make a careless error. 
My suggestion is before you turn this thing in to get your part twos and part three type stuff here, just go back over it and look over it one more time and look for the careless errors. You know you made them, go find them. Okay? And once you're satisfied that you ace this part, turn it in and let's part part two. Part two. Now, you will see this. I've still got about 20 more minutes to go before I'm officially allowed to use my calculator. That doesn't mean just sit there and wait for the time to give your calculator before you can start this thing. You should go ahead and start uh, part two and part three because I'm telling you right now, most of the test is still going to be done without a calculator. Taking the derivatives, taking the antiderivatives, finding the, the slope of the tangent line, finding the velocity or acceleration or something like that, or possibly even a word problem. Remember, word problems, we're going to hit you guys hard on two major concepts in terms of word problems. Those word problems are related rates and optimization. Make sure you study those things intensely because you're going to see those guys on the final exam because they're a major concept from Calc 1. All right, so here we go. And yet, I'm going to show you that even then, most of this stuff I'm going to use without a calculator. So here we go. Part two, multiple choice with a calculator, but still don't have my calculator yet. But do I need it on this first one? Well, let's take a look. Find the x coordinates of the point on the curve y equals uh, f, uh, y equals 4x cubed minus 15x squared minus 18x where the tangent line is horizontal. This is a concept question. Horizontal tangent line. So if I got some kind of weird thing like this or like this, you notice that a horizontal tangent line is the spot where there are your function is max or mins. A horizontal tangent line means the derivative is what? Zero. Zero. So basically, what are they asking me to do to this problem? Even though it's not saying find the critical numbers, they're asking me to find the critical numbers, just worded differently. This is what you're looking for when you go back over these old exams. How are they going to try to mess you up by asking you weird questions? Find the x-coordinates of, of the function where you have a horizontal tangent line. That means take derivative, set it equal zero, and solve. All right, so... My derivative is going to be 12x squared minus 30x minus 18. Horizontal tangent line, because we know the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. There'd be a horizontal line that's a slope of zero. This is where the concept comes from. So I've got this nice quadratic, and I'm saying I'm equal to zero. Do I need a calculator for this? No. The only time I would probably use a calculator is if the quadratic didn't factor and I have to use the quadratic formula. But look at my answer. That's telling me the, 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 the guy's going to factor. All right? So how do I solve this thing? Well, first thing I'll notice is that I can factor something out of this guy. What can I factor out? I can factor a 6 out, leaving me with 2x squared minus 5x minus uh, 16, uh, 18 divided by 6 is 3. <coughs> Equal to 0. Now I'm going to factor. Let's see here, 2x times x, what times what is 3, and that when I subtract them, I get 5. Well, remember, I also have to multiply it times 2. So to get 5, I want to do the 2x times 3, and then I want to multiply that times 1. And the 2x in the middle term has to be a negative 5, so I want the bigger number to be negative. So I'll put a negative there. That'll give me a negative 6x plus a 1x. There's my 5x right there. And the last guy. And if you don't know, pull this guy out, you'll get, to get the same thing again equal to zero. Now to solve this guy, I'm going to set both factors equal to zero. And I'm going to solve. As I have 2x plus 1 equals zero, subtract 1, I get 2x equals negative 1, divide by 2, x is equal to negative 1 half. Over here, my other factor was x minus 3, set it equal to zero, add 3 to both sides, I get x equals 3. Sorry. Does that make sense? So I get negative one half and three, which is answer C. Now I want you to notice something other here too. Yes, I'm being long-winded on these doing these problems. I'm not trying to skip any steps for you guys, but you shouldn't skip steps on the test either. Now you're right, I can probably solve this in my head. 2x plus 1 equals 0, but I went way out of my way. I subtracted 1 from both sides. I divided by 2 on both sides. You know why? Careless errors. 
Because I'm telling you, some people in here are going to put look at this thing and do it in their head and say the x equals one half. They forgot to move it to the other side, and by actually not missing a step, your last chance of making a careless error. These are my little tricks to get you guys to do better on the exam. Just march through your algebra stuff. Watch for the careless error, because you'll notice that oh, I, I did it wrong and I got one half because I just I just did it in my head and I messed it up. But you'll notice that hey, one half is one of your answers up here. You get the point. Be careful on this thing, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the answer, and for the other multiple choices, we're going to mess them up by changing the sign on these guys and doing all kinds of stuff to them. All right, take a look at the next guy. Another classic question they're going to ask you. It is this. If the function f of x equals x squared, uh, where x is less than or equal to 1, and 2x plus k, where x is greater than 1, so I have a piecewise function, and they want it to be continuous at x equals 1, then what's the value of k? Remember your definition of continuous. Now, granted, we have the old high school algebra definition of continuous. You don't lift your pencil from the paper. But from a calculus perspective, for a, for a function to be continuous, it has to, one, the functional value has to exist, Number two, the limit has to exist. And number three, they've got to be equal to each other. Clearly, this thing is a piecewise function and it's broke at one. The functional value exists because when I plug in, i got equal to one here. When I plug it in, I'll get a value here, which would be one. But the trick is, how does the limit exist? The limit exists when the limit from the left, say the limit as x approaches one from the left, is actually equal to the limit as x approaches one from the right. This is when the limit exists, right? So, when if I, to be going to the limit as x approaches 1 from the left, that means slightly less than 1. And which piece do I get to use on my piecewise function if i got x's that are less than 1? I use the x squared guy. That's got to be equal to the limit as x approaches 1 from the right or positive side. That's slightly greater than 1. To be bigger than 1, that's going to be the limit of the function 2x plus k. First rule of limits is what? What do I do when I'm doing limits? Plug in a number. 1, 1 squared is 1, equals, plug in 1, 2 times 1 is 2, plus k. Now I've got to solve for k. I would subtract 2 from both sides, and I get k is equal to 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. The answer is b, negative 1. Does that make sense? Okay. Here we go again. F of x equals x to the fourth minus 6x cubed minus 60x squared on which interval is f concave down? If they ask you questions about concavity, what does that happen to deal with? Second derivative. F double prime. But to get to f double prime, I've got to take the first derivative first. That would be 4x cubed minus 18x squared minus 120x. Now I'm going to take the second derivative which will be 12x squared minus 36x minus 120. Does that make sense? Now, well, to find intervals of concavity, first I have to find the inflection point. So I'm going to set this guy equal to 0 and solve. And any time you hear the words, find the intervals on a calculus test, you're always going to draw a number line. Intervals of concavity is the number line with the second order. Well, how do I solve this guy? Well, notice I have a 12 in common on all this quadratic, so I'm going to factor the 12 out. That will leave me with x squared minus uh, 3x minus 10 equals 0. Factoring it some more and looking at my answers over here, I can tell you right now that it's going to factor nicely. x, x, what times what is 10 that differ by 3? Got to be 5 and 2, and since it's a minus, we have opposite signs, and we want the bigger number to be negative. That'll be uh, x minus 5 times x plus 2. You set each factor that has an x in it equal to 0, and you solve x is equal to 5, x is equal to negative 2. Those are my inflection points. Now, I can let you know right now, this is one of those interesting problems, but I can let you know right now that... <laughs> The answer's got to be D because it's the only one that has negative 2 and 5 in it. So, uh, so I'll go ahead and circle that. But I will show you why the answer is actually uh, D. That's because they asked for the intervals, so therefore I'm going to draw my number line. This is dealing with the second derivative. Here is uh, negative 2, my first inflection point. Always put them in order. And here's 5, my other inflection point. 
and they are in order because this is a number line. And now I'm going to plug in a number less than negative 2 into my second derivative. I will plug in negative 3 and to this guy and I can either plug it into the original equation or I can plug it in down here and do the same thing we did. Right now, I still, looking at my watch, still don't have the calculator. I have not been given the word on the calculator yet. I can still do this problem without a calculator. Plug in negative 3. What is negative 3 minus 5? Negative 8. So I got 12, which is positive, times negative 8, times negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. That's negative. Positive times negative times negative is positive. So I know it's concave up in that interval. Pick a number. Use your brain. Between negative 2 and 5. Excellent choice. Zero. I would go back and use this secondary to plug in zero. And when I plug in zero, I clearly get negative 120. I don't care what the number is. It's negative. So everybody in there is negative. It means it's concave down there. So it's concave up here, concave down. And a number bigger than five, I clearly I choose six. Plugging in here, 12 is positive. Six minus five is one, which is positive. And six plus two is eight, which is positive. It's big and positive. So I'm back to being positive there, second derivative, that's concave up. So where is it concave down at? Right in the middle, between negative 2 and 5. So the answer is between negative 2 and 5 is my answer. Does that make sense? Take a look at number 4. They love to do this to you guys on the, on the test. They will give you not the actual function, they will give you the uh, derivative graph or the second derivative graph and then ask you questions about the original function to get you guys to quote think outside the box. All right, so what did they give me in this problem? The graph of who? This is the graph of the derivative is shown. Over which intervals is f concave up? That's what we want to know. Concave up. When are you concave up? So let's analyze that. Concave up. What does that mean? Second derivative is what? Greater than zero. But what exactly is the second derivative? The second derivative, by definition, the second derivative is the derivative of the derivative, right? So the second derivative is derivative of the derivative. So I want to look at this graph from a derivative perspective. The derivative is the slope of the tangent line. So look at this graph right here. Even though it's f prime of x, I'm going to look at the derivative of this guy. This point's over here. What kind of slope do I have in this interval between like negative 2 to negative 1? It's sloping down. So here, I know my second derivative is less than 0. What kind of slope do I have between negative 1 and 1? That thing slopes which way? You read a graph from left to right. So this thing on the le left side goes down. This one goes up. You with me? So that my second derivative here is going to be greater than 0, up to 1. And then past 1, what kind of slopes of tangent lines do I have over here? Going back down again, negative slope. So my second derivative again is negative. They want it to be concave up. So where is it positive at? Between negative 1 and 1. So the answer here is negative 1 to 1, which is answer C. Does that make sense? You've got the derivative graph. They're asking about concavity. So I take that graph and mentally take the derivative of that. Look for the derivative, which is the uh, increase-decrease stuff. All right. Number five, the graph of y equals f of x is shown. Which of the following, and pay attention to this type of thing, is not true? All right, so I'm afraid with this type of question, you don't have a choice. This type of question doesn't mean go find the answer. You've got to look at all the answers and go yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So this is one of those classic problems where I have to analyze the actual answers to the question. Does the limit as x approaches 1 from the plus side, that's right, of f of x equal 1? Well, let's see here. From the right, if I go into the right, the functional value is 1, so that checks. This will be true. We're not trying to go out and it's not true, so we're looking for the false guy. Okay? Is the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x 1? Remember, the definition, a full definition of a limit is the limit from the left has got to be equal to the limit from the right. If I go after 3... I go from the left, the function going from the left is going to be 1. The function as I go from the right is equal to 1. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 3 of uh, f of x is actually going towards that value right there, which is 1. This checks. This is true. 
is f of 3 equal to 2. This is the dot. When x is 3, where's the dot at? Here's 3. Where's the dot at? It is over here at 2. So f of 3 equals 2. This checks. This is true. So clearly the answer is either D or E. Is F continuous at X equal 2? Well, you can use the old college algebra definition. Did I lift my pencil from the paper at 2? <laughs> no, I didn't. So it's continuous. But you also look at it like this. The functional value is somewhere here at negative 1. The limit from the left is equal to negative 1. The limit from the right is going to negative 1. Everybody's equal to negative 1 when I, in terms of a Y coordinate. So it is continuous. This is true. Is it differentiable at x equals 2? What does the word differentiable mean? It means if a function be differentiable, it has to be smooth. No sharp turn. It has to be continuous and smooth. It's clearly continuous, but is it smooth? No, this is a, 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 a absolute value looking thing. This is a sharp edge. That's called a cusp. And you're not differentiable at cusps, sharp edges. So this one is the false one. So the answer is e. Does that make sense? All right, more graph stuff here, but pay attention now. The graph of y equals f of x. All right, now this is my original function. This is f of x now. It's shown below. Decide which statements is true. So this time I'm trying to find the true guy. All right, so same type of deal here. Now if I look at this thing, we're obviously looking at first derivatives and second derivative. First derivative deals with increase, decrease. Second derivative deals with concavity. So, what is my first derivative? Is the first derivative greater than zero and the second derivative um, less than zero on the interval between zero and infinity? Okay, here's zero right here in infinity, so I guess this thing keeps going on. Clearly, I have, I'm going down, so the, second the first derivative is negative on this guy for the entire way from zero to infinity, so I'm always going down. The slope is always down. Does that make sense? But what about concavity? In terms of second derivative, so this goes from 0 to infinity. In terms of concavity, I'm concave down this way. You notice it's u down until what point? Right about 2, I guess. This is concave down. But once you hit 2, so it's concave down between 0 and 2, and it is concave up. Now it's u-shaped up, holds water type thing here, between 2 and infinity. Okay. Concave down, the bend is down. Concave down, that's second derivative negative. The bend is up, that's second derivative positive. Concave up. So which one of these guys is that? Well, let's see here. Well, let's see here. Is it uh, always concave? Let's see. So to be true now, it's going to be the first derivative has to be negative. So it's either C, D, or E. You with me? Is the second derivative always concave down? No, it's not always concave down. Is the second derivative always concave up? So this is false. These two guys are false. This is false and this is false. So believe it or not, what's the answer? E. None of the statements are true because this is the actual real answer. Does that make sense? It is not concave up between 0 and to infinity because it's concave down here, concave up here. It's not concave up from 0 to infinity. So it's actually the second derivative that is being violated because I got some places where the second derivative is negative, some places where the second derivative is positive. So it's not always from 0 to infinity, always one way or the other. All right, questions. Number seven. And notice, I have not used my calculator yet on this thing. All right, number seven. This is another one of those definitional things. I don't get really need a calculator. There's no need to use a calculator on the definition thing. Suppose that the function f of x is continuous at the point x equals 2. Which of the following is not always true? So basically, as I was telling you before, don't forget to know the definition of continuous. A function is continuous if three things hold. What are those three things that hold to make a function continuous? The functional value has to exist. The limit as x approaches a, and that's both sides of f of x, has to exist. And the most important thing is the third thing is once they exist, they got to be equal to each other. f of a equals the limit as x approaches a of f of x. This is the definition of being continuous at a function. The functional value exists, f of a exists. 
In our case, it'll be 2. f of 2 exists. The limit as x approaches 2 of f of x exists. Uh, a is 2 in this problem. And f of a equals, or f of 2 equals, the limit as x approaches a or 2 of f of x. They've got to be equal to each other. So let's take a look here. Does f to 2 have to exist? This is always true. Does the limit uh, as x approaches 2 have to exist? Yep. And how does a full limit exist? A full limit exists when the limit from the left is equal to the limit from the right. Right? So the list is the limit from the, and this is the limit from the right, so it has to exist as well. If the limit exists, then the one side of the limit has to exist. And the last thing is the limit has to be equal to the functional value. So this is true. The one thing that does not have to be true about a function that's continuous is does it have to be differentiable? No, I can have cusp there, nice sharp turns, which are like the last problem. This is the one that is false. The answer is B. Your derivative does not have to exist. I can have these sharp turn cusp looking things. And, but it's continuous, but it's not differentiable at that point. Does that make sense? So that's a definition thing. No calculator yet. All right. You no doubt saw this one several times on your web work problems. So you're going to see this guy on the final exam as well. The old use the chart bit. All right. Use the information in the table below to evaluate at g of f prime of 1. First off, if y is equal to g of f of x, what does this really mean right here? What is this g of, what does that little circle mean? Composition of functions. This is a, the same thing as g of f of x. That's composition of functions. g is on the outside, f of x is on the inside. And now they want me to do what? They want me to find the derivative of this guy. So to find the derivative of this guy, what rule do I have to use on this thing? Being g's on the outside and f is on the inside. It's a chain rule problem. That's why we use the chain rule because it deals with composition functions. Functions on the outside, functions on the inside. Chain rule is, if you're the outside, inside stays the same time you're the inside. Remember the words. They help out so much with this stuff. Drive the outside, that will be g prime the inside, f of x stays the same, times the derivative of the inside. The inside is f of x, so the derivative of that would be f prime of x. That's my derivative, but what do they want me to find? They want me to find y prime with the derivative at 1. That would be g prime of f of 1 times f prime of 1. Order of operations, you always work inside the parentheses first. What is f of 1? All right, now I get to use my chart. x is 1, f of 1 is what? 2 times f prime of 1. What is g prime of 2? Well, here's g prime. When x is 2, I get 4 using my chart. What's f prime of 1? When x is 1, f prime is negative 3. You with me? Lost you guys anywhere. And 4 times negative 3, last time I checked, is? Don't need a calculator for that either. Negative 12. Answer is A. That makes sense. Don't lose you guys anywhere. All right. Keep going. Oh, here's another one. This is why you go over old final exams. Because you, we've covered so much material. Of course, you have it all memorized. But sometimes it's nice to go over it to remind yourself of what you're supposed to have memorized. Here's one. The linearization approximation L of x of the function f of x equals the square root of 9 plus 18x at the point x equals 0. Well, you have to know what the linearization equation is. And if you get in trouble, remember this. Linearization is the same thing as the equation of the tangent line. Same thing. But we had a special form called linearization formula. So if you have that memorized, great. But if you ever get lost and they say the word linearization, find the equation of the tangent line. It's going to be the same answer. But my linearization formula, since they want linearization, L of X thing here, I'll let you know what it is. L of X is equal to F of A plus F prime of A times X minus A. It was a formula, which if you look at it, is the point slope formula that you solve for Y in. It's, but they just made it fancy for you guys. Okay? What is A in this problem? A, which is the value, is going to be zero. So I need two things. I need to know what the functional value is, f of a. So f of a would be f of 0. That's easy to do. 
This would be uh, the square root of, I'll slide this over, you guys see it. See what I'm doing here. This would be 9 plus 18 times 0. 18 times 0 is uh, 0. So this is the square root of 9, which is 3. Usually the A is going to be a good point. So F of 0 equals 3. I do need to know what F prime is. So come over here, F prime of X. Well, F of X, I've got to clean them up first, is 9 plus 18X to the 1 half power. So I'm going to use the chain rule. 1 half, 9 plus 18X, right chain rule, draw the outside, raise to negative 1 half, times draw the inside, which is uh, 18. Cleaning this guy up, F prime of X would be equal to 2 goes into 18 uh, 9 times, divided by a negative exponent, put you on the bottom, that's the square root of 9 plus 18X. That's great, but what do I want to know? I want to know what f prime of a is, which is going to be f prime of 0. Plugging 0 into this thing, I'm going to get 9 divided by 18 times 0 is 0 plus 9 is 9, so that's the square root of 9. That is 9 over 3, square root of 9 is 3, and what is 9 divided by 3? 3. So, plugging it into my linearization equation, L of X is equal to F of A, which was 3, times plus, plus F prime of A, which is 3, times X minus A, and A was 0 in this problem. Does that make sense? So, clean it up. Well, oh, X minus 0, that's hard. So, what do I get? I get L of X is equal to 3 plus 3X. Three There's my answer, which is answer uh, A. Does that make sense? Questions? Linearization. But if you take this problem and say, instead of the word linearization, and we use the word, here's a function. you got the x equals a. Find the equation of the tangent line. You've got to have a point slope. The x is 0. I can get the y coordinate. I plug it into the original equation, which would end up giving me 3. So there's my point, 0, 3. And then use the point slope formula, and there's my derivative, which is my slope of my tangent line. And you plug it in uh, to the point slope formula and solve for y, you'll get the exact same answer. y equals 3 plus 3x. Same thing. All right. Number 10. You are supposed to do this. Take the limit as x approaches 0 from the left side of x divided by the absolute value of x. All right. First rule of limits, plug in a number. Problem is, when I plug in a number, I get 0 over 0. So I should use L'Hopital's rule. <laughs> Only problem with using L'Hopital's rule on this problem is, do you guys know what the derivative of the absolute value of x is? Me neither, because that's a function that we haven't actually taken the derivative of, because it's got a problem at 0 anyway, because it has a cusp there. So this is a classic problem where you've got to go back to the basic definition of limits. What is my basic definition of limits? It is this. I want to take limit as x approaches 0 from the left. So I'm going to do the classic t-bar type thing here, x, y, and I'm going to plug in numbers very close to 0 but slightly left, which is the negative side of 0. So I'm going to plug in numbers like negative 0.1, negative 0.01, negative 0.001. So here's a great place to use the calculator. Yeah, if you need to, but I don't think so. Let's see here. Plug it in. Negative 0.1 divided by the absolute value of negative 0.1. Well, this would be negative 0.1 divided by the absolute value of negative 0.1. Catch a pattern here. What's the absolute value of anybody? Positive. Positive. So this is negative 0.1 divided by 0.1. And what is negative 0.1 divided by positive 0.1 going to give me? Negative 1. This would be negative 0.01 divided by absolute value of negative 0.01. I'm going to get the same thing. This will be negative 0.01 divided by positive 0.01, which is negative 1. I think I figured out what the limit is. This is negative 0.001 divided by absolute value of negative 0.001, which is equal to negative 0.001 divided by positive 0.001, which is still negative 1. What is my answer to this limit? Negative 1 answers A. This is from chapter 1 from calculus. Uh, basically, it's one of these classic problems where you, know, you can't always use L'Hopital's rule, especially when you can't take the derivative of the function. Questions? Number 11. Take the limit as x approaches 2 
All right, so I'm going to rewrite this. You guys can see it. Take the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 3x minus 10 divided by x minus 2. What's the first rule of limits? So they're doing some limit problems, all that chapter 1 stuff. What's the first rule of limits? Plug in a number. 2 squared is 4. Plus three times uh, four, uh, three times three, three times two, x is going to two. Three times two is six, minus ten over two minus two, and four plus six is ten. Minus ten is uh, what's the surprise? Zero over zero. Now you could do the chapter one way of doing this, which means if I got zero over zero, then some algebra can be done. I can factor this guy and cancel one term out. But now you got this is final exam stuff. We've actually revisited limits and came up with a nice, neat way of taking the limit when I get 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity. I recommend doing this, being we are calculus students. I would use L'Hopital's rule anytime I got 0 over 0 infinity over infinity. So this would be equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of the derivative of the top, which is uh, 2x plus 3, over the derivative of the bottom, which is 1. And then what do you do? All about limits, plug in a number. Uh, 2 times 2 plus 3 divided by 1. 2 times 2 is 4 plus 3 is 7 divided by 1 is uh, 7. Get 7. Does that make sense? And I yet to use my calculator. It's still up here. I brought it today. It's right here, but I don't need it. All right. So now we're getting more than halfway through this exam here, way more than halfway through it. So now the problems are going to get more, uh, more, I wouldn't say difficult, but more theoretical in nature. Here's one right here. Evaluate the limit as h approaches 0 of uh, 2 plus h quantity squared minus 2 plus h minus 2 all over h. Okay. So this one, all right, how do I evaluate this thing? Well, they didn't quite give me the function type of thing here. So, here's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to clean this guy up, and I'm going to do classic limit stuff. Take the limit as h approaches 0. How do I clean up 2 plus h quantity squared? What am I going to do? Uh, not factor it out. Uh, the other word. I'm going to fold it out. Okay. This would give me, folding this out, 2 times 2 is uh, 4. 2 times h is 2h, plus a new 2 times h is another 2h, that gives me 4h. And h times h is h squared. Minus 2 minus h minus 2 all over h. I distribute it also, I fold it out and distribute my negative, clean this guy up. This is one way, if you remember, this used to be known as like the, uh, when we started doing these kind of problems with the uh, take the limit as h goes to zero stuff, this is your definition of derivative. I remind you, the definition of derivative is f prime of x is equal to limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h stuff. This is one way of us working those skills from the beginning of chapter two of making you guys do the old derivative of the hard way stuff. Because they didn't even give you the function, they just gave it to you as a limit. Clean this guy up, let's see what we got here. Four. Minus 2, minus 2 cancels. And that's going to leave me with the limit as h approaches 0 of a 4h minus h. What's 4h minus h? 3h plus h squared over h. And I want to remind you, anytime you got 0 over 0, I mean, granted, I could use L'Hopital's rule on this thing, but the goal is to actually show you how to get the answer here. I'm just practicing my limit laws. Anytime I got this uh, with the divide by h, the goal is to cancel out the h. I got an h in every term, but you can only cancel fractions through strict multiplication division. So I can factor out the h, and that would give me 3 plus h over h. h is cancel here. This gives me the limit as h approaches 0 of 3 plus h. And what's the major rule about limits? Once you cancel the h's out, all you got to do is limits, plug in a number. Plug in 0. 3 plus 0 is 3. So what is my answer in this problem? Three. I could also have used, at this point right here, I could have also, once I cleaned this guy up, I could have used L'Hopital's rule, the autofocus thing working here. Does that make sense? Questions? All right. Number 13. 
That f of x be equal to 2x cubed plus x squared minus 4x. Find the minimum value on the, uh, on the interval between 0 and 2. And they gave you a little hint here, but you should know, especially if you're my students, but I know Desiree emphasizes this as well, the concept of this. When they ask you for the value of a function, what are you going to give them? The y coordinate. Occurs at, what are you going to give them? X coordinate. The value is the y coordinate. Occurs at is the x coordinate. It's kind of a word problem thing on finding out max mins. Value is the y coordinate. But they gave you a hint here. Huh, please give the y back. Okay, so, uh, all right. So, how do we find, how do you maximize and minimize anything? What are you going to do? Take derivative, set equals zero, and solve. Find those critical points. So, here's my derivative, which is 6x squared plus 2x minus 4. Set him equal to zero, and solve. Take a look at these answers. All right, this is not going to be very nice because it's a quadratic equal to zero, and I'm getting some kind of fraction thing here. So uh, I'm expecting to be able to fraction. This is going to behave some kind of fraction, but it should because these are relatively nice numbers here. This thing should factor. Well, first off, what can you do to this thing? I'm setting equal to zero. What do you have in common? You can factor out a two. This leaves you with 3x squared plus x minus 2 equal to zero. Now, does this thing factor? Let's see here. 3x times what and x. And 2 has got to be 2 and 1, but I want a middle term of 1. So I want to make sure that uh, I get a 3 times a 1. That will give me the 3. And then the 2 times a 1. Uh, two, excuse me, 3x times 1 gives you a 3x. 2 times an x gives me a 1x. And I want a difference to be plus 1. So it's a difference. I want the bigger number to be positive. So it's plus minus. Do your classic factor. And if you're not sure, fold it back out just to double check, make sure you got the right guy. Now, I'm going to set each factor, 3x minus 2 equals 0, and x plus 1 equals 0. Solving for x, add 2 to both sides, I get 3x equals 2, I divide by 3, I get x equals 2 thirds. On this one, I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides, I get x equals negative 1. How many critical numbers do I have? Actually, I have one. Why? Pay attention to the interval. What are we trying to find the minimum value of? Over a closed interval, you're guaranteed to have an absolute max, absolute min. My interval is between 0 and 2. Pay attention to this, because this is where it screwed it up on the test. It's between 0 and 2. Where's negative 1 at? Negative 1 is not between 0 and 2. Does that make sense? So omit negative 1 because he's not within my interval. I only have one point, which is 2 thirds. That's right inside my interval here. But anytime you're trying to find the absolute max, absolute mins, you've got to find the critical point, and you want to compare it to the EPs, the endpoints. My critical point was 2 thirds. My endpoints are 0 and 2. All right. So let's get the autofocus work on this thing. All right, so here we go. Now, how do I find the y-coordinates on this guy? To find the y-coordinates, you've got to plug these guys back into the original equation. I'll help you out. I'll plug 0 into the original equation for you. Uh, pretty much 0. Good. What about the other guys? Finally, i got a problem that I could really use a calculator on. All right, because i got fractions on this thing. So, here we go. Using my calculator, I'm going to plug in 2 thirds. This will be 2 times 2 thirds cubed plus 2 thirds squared minus 4 times 2 thirds. With me, plugging in x is my 2 thirds, and what do I get? And they clearly want fractions on this thing. Negative 44 over 27. Negative 44 over 27. Zero, zero, great. Now I want to plug in two, all right? This will be two times two cubed plus two squared minus four times two, I get 12. How do I figure out which one's the absolute max? How do I figure out which one's the absolute min? Well, the lowest one's going to be the absolute min, so the lowest one's got to be the negative. So this is the absolute 
min. And by the way, the absolute max, in case you're studying that kind of problem, would be the one that would 12, with the biggest y coordinate. All I'm doing is now comparing the y coordinates. Does that make sense? All right, so here we go. This is the absolute minimum. They want me to find the minimum, and the minimum value is the y coordinate, so the answer is b, negative 44 over 27. Does that make sense? Questions? Yes, ma'am. How'd you get the fraction you, uh, on your calculator? Which, what number did you press? Uh, math fraction. Mm, okay. Uh, let me show you. I typed in, let me put it up here so you guys can see it. Can you guys see that up there? All right. I typed in two thirds into my calculator, right? And I got some crappy decimal. Now, there's a button on this calculator, and let me uh, darken this thing up and slide it up here so you guys can autofocus a little bit. There's a button called math. And I'm using the TI-84. Yeah. All right. If I hit math, number one, convert answer to fraction. And it's kind of nice. That's worth the 150 bucks you pay for it. There it is. All right. Here we go. Another formula you have to have memorized. Number 14. Suppose... Newton's method uses to need you want to use Newton's method to solve the equation x cubed plus 2x minus 1 equals 0. If the initial guess is 1, the next approximation would be what would be my next iteration, x2. What is Newton's method? Newton's method, xn plus 1 equals xn minus what? f of xn divided by f prime of xn. A formula you have to have memorized for this exam. Okay? Now on this problem, remember, to use Newton's method, you look for zeros, roots, x-intercepts. It's where the function is equal to zero. Hence, what is my function in this particular problem? My function is going to be what? x cubed plus 2x minus 1. If they happen to give you an equation where you got something equal to something else, you got to pull everything to one side and set it equal to zero to be able to get your function. Does that make sense? All right, so there's my function, and here comes my derivative, which is 3x squared plus 2. They want me to find the second iteration, x2. This would be equal to the first iteration, x1, and n is 1, basically. n is 1, so 1 plus 1 is 2. n is 1, that would be uh, x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1. But x1 is what in this problem? 1. So this is 1 minus the functional value at 1 divided by the derivative at 1. So this is 1 minus. Now I can use my calculator, and I showed you guys how to plug numbers into the calculator. But this one, since I'm only doing one iteration, I don't have to really hurt myself on, on beating to death the calculator. Um, 1 cubed is uh, 1, 2 times 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, minus 1 is uh, 2. Divided by the derivative at 1, 1 squared is 1 times 3 is 3 plus 1 is 5. And I, either I can do this on the calculator or do it in my head. What is 1 minus 2 fifths? 3 fifths. And what is 3 fifths in terms of a decimal? 0.6, but some people just get real worried when I start doing stuff like that in my head. So let me show you. 1 minus 2 fifths. Uh, 0.6. Okay, cool. All right, so the answer is 6. Does that make sense? But notice, I, I mean, I could use some fancy methods on doing this problem, but I really didn't need it. But the most important thing was, did you have Newton's method memorized? And students screw this problem up by doing one of two things. They'll get the formula wrong by either putting the making the minus a plus. That's a classic mistake. It's a minus. And the other one is, what is the guy in the numerator on this, the fraction part? The function. The derivative is in the denominator. Don't reverse them. You'll shoot off to a never-never land and never get the right answer if you get them reversed. All right. Hey, great, a word problem. Because you know you're going to get hit with the word problems. We haven't done the free response part yet. But here we go. Oh, the spherical snowball thing is melting in such a way that its radius r is decreasing at a rate of 3 centimeters per hour. How fast is the volume decreasing when r equals 2 centimeters? And wow, they were really nice to me. They gave me the volume form of first sphere. Volume equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. Something you actually should know, but there it is. All right. What kind of problem is this guy? Pay attention to units. 
we're talking about, okay, spherical snowball melting disk wave R is decreasing at a rate of 3 centimeters per hour. It's decreasing, so officially, if I'm going to do this problem right, it's negative, right? And who is this? This is the, the radius is decreasing. Look at those units, centimeters per hour. So who is this guy, being it's the radius decreasing? dr over dt, and this is a related rate problem. When you've got units like centimeters per hour, uh, meters per second, feet per second, miles per hour, that per thing, that's going to be a related rate, and these are derivative guys. That per means derivative. All right. How fast is the volume decreasing? Volume decreasing. So what am I looking for? dv over dt, because volume decreasing. Fast, that's a rate. Rate means derivative, volume decreasing. dv dt is what when r equals 2. Well, they gave me the formula for the spherical snowball thing here, which is volume is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. I'm going to take the derivative of this guy, but this is a related rate. I'm taking the derivative with respect to t. So every time I take a derivative of a variable, I tack on d variable dt, related rate problems. So derivative of v is going to be 1, it's a variable 1, dv dt. So dv dt is equal to 4 thirds pi is a constant, leave it alone. What's the derivative of r cubed? It is 3r squared, but remember, every time you take derivative of a variable, you've got to tack on times who? dr dt, related rate. Every time you take derivative of a variable in a related rate problem, you tack on d variable dt. This guy's canceled here, gives me dv over dt is equal to 4 pi r squared dr dt. Now what am I supposed to do? Oh yeah, I'm supposed to find dv dt when r equals 2. So this would be equal to 4 pi r is 2 squared, but what was dr dt equal to? Officially it's uh, negative 3 centimeters per hour. All right, so let's clean this guy up. I don't think I need a calculator. I can do this in my head. 2 squared is 4, and 4 times 4 is 16, right? And 16 times 3, uh, negative 3 is what? Negative 48. 16 times 3 is negative 48. Pi, and what would my units be? This is volume. This is why you love the, the uh, related rate problems, because you're... you're uh, Variable using the Newtonian notation here, actually Leipzig's notation, dv dt, tells you the actual um, uh, units, volume per time. What would volume be measured in being the distance is centimeters? Centimeters cubed per time is measured in hours. But just like the web work problems, the true answer is negative 48 pi centimeters cubed per hour. But because they asked this, what is the, what is the uh, how fast is the volume decreasing? What does decreasing mean to you? It's going down, it's negative, so they're telling you the answer is going to be negative, so they just want the value, which is what value? The value is just the 48 pi uh, centimeters cubed per hour, the answer is D again. That makes sense. <coughs> Questions? You guys good? Question for you. How bad has this exam been so far? Uh, what was the class average of 64 on this exam then? Class average on this exam was a 64. Out of all 2,000 students that took the uh, calculus, uh, this calculus exam last semester, the class average was a 64. Why? Drugs. I have no idea. I, just, just took <laughs> this, I thought this was a, such an easy exam. But still, I, I think the one mistake was careless errors. Honestly, I think a lot of people, take your time. we still got lots of time. I've still not even dented my three hours into this thing here. And now I'm on to the free response. Now, the free, uh, the free response, of course, show all your work. And as I mentioned to you guys before, you know something about the problem. Write it down. Never leave anything blank on the final exam. You know something. For free response, you know something, always write it down, number one. Number two, you understand that we have a committee that ends up grading the free response part of this exam. 
It's all the math professors that teach Calc 1 all get together and we sit in a big room and we grade all 2,000 free responses. And what we do is we break them up. There's like five or six questions on, on the free response and each professor gets one question. And sometimes we team up, but typically each professor gets one question. And I grade one question 2,000 times. All right? Now, so we can go rather quickly on this. The key to it is consistency. So again, this is all about competition. Everybody's getting the exact same style grade on this one and see how well you guys do versus your neighbors. Now you guys are for the most part are my students and Desiree students. We have pride in our students. You came to us and wanted to teach us stuff. This is big competition, not just between students, but also between professors. And since you're my students, by God, you will do well on this exam or you will fail my class. Okay. So, um, <laughs> The point is this, though. Do the best you possibly can. Never leave anything blank. The other thing is also, when doing these kind of problems, they're going to try to help you out with these multiple step things. So don't let this stuff throw you off. The other thing is this. Yes, we enjoy the rude comments that people, that some of the students write on this thing about they don't know how to do this problem. So they'll write something rude about not how to They don't actually write math down. They write bad words instead. Okay, fine. My students don't do this. My students are the best. Desiree's students are the best. We don't do this. We'll let uh, one of the other professor's students do this, and we'll make fun of them and call them idiots and stuff in the committee. Yes, we do that. But don't do this. You know something. This is a math exam. Write mathematics on this thing. All right, let's take a look at this first guy. They're going to try to help you out with the steps. Look at what they're doing on this problem. It says this. In this problem, we will find the x and y coordinate of uh, x and y coordinates of the point of the line where y equals 3x plus 1 is closest to the origin. Let's analyze that word right there. Closest. What does that mean? Distance, distance will be minimized. This is a distance problem. It is a related rate. I mean, excuse me. It is a optimization problem. It is. We're going to minimize distance. It's an optimization problem. We're looking for the minimum. We're going to take the root of somebody, set him equal to zero, and solve. Who are we going to take the root of? of? Who's the objective here? The distance. So we need the distance formula. So I, I, if I get lost on this thing, go to the side of the paper, and if you get lost on their steps, don't panic. Do what you think comes natural, answer their question, and then go back and try to fill in the blanks if you can't figure it out. But they're going to give you the steps on trying to do this thing. All right. And they kind of go with my steps and Desiree's steps as we taught optimization. So the first thing is this, part A. The distance between two points, x1, x1 y1, y, x2, y2, is given by, wow, what, how decent of them. They gave you the distance formula. Personally, in my class, I made my students memorize this thing from high school algebra 2 or whatever, but there it is. The distance formula. Use the distance formula to express distance between the points x, y, and 0, 0. So here is the first point. Here is the second point. And guess what I'm going to do? Distance will be equal to the square root of x minus 0 squared. X, 1 plug in. Uh, excuse, let's, let's see here. Let me put it in right here. This I did to actually do it this way. This is my second point. This is my first point. It doesn't matter which way you plug it in, honestly. But x and y are my second point. So x2, that'll be x, minus the first point, a 0. Quantity squared plus y, which is y2, y, which is y2, minus 0 squared. And clean them up. I mean, it helps out. d is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. This is what they were after. Okay? There you go. Distance equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. It's the distance formula. But they first want to put it in arbitrary terms. That's part A. This is your optimization equation. This is the dude you want to take the root about because they want to be closest, a.k.a. minimize distance. The second thing is this. Suppose the point x, y is on the line. What they're telling me is y is actually equal to 3x plus 1, right? So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to replace y with 3x plus 1. Use the fact to the result to express a as a distance x y as a function of x alone. I got too many variables on this thing. This is my constraint equation. They are walking me through this thing, leading me by the nose to do this problem. D is equal to the square root of x squared plus parentheses three x plus one squared. This was your answer. 
They just the only they wanted you to do was, hey, there's y, but this is the y coordinate is equal to 3x plus 1. Replace y with 3x plus 1. There's my answer. Now, I am going to take dirt of this guy, so I really do want to clean this guy up. But this is the answer they're looking for. They would have also accepted this one. Or if I clean this guy up, d would be the square root of x squared plus, and I would foil this guy out, 3x plus 1 quantity squared. That is 9x squared plus 6x plus 1, which gives me d is the square root of 10x squared plus 6x plus 1. Does that make sense? Combine like terms. They would also have accepted this answer. Because this is the guy that I really need because you are not happy in calculus 1 until you take the root of somebody. Typically, set them equal 0 and solve. This is your life. Welcome, welcome to calculus. All right. Part C. And notice they gave me lots of room for part C here. Use the... Um, Use calculus <laughs> to determine the value of x that minimizes the distance between the points. How do you minimize anything? What are you going to do? Take derivative, set them equal to zero, and solve. You've been programmed personally by me, so here we go. D, after I clean them up, is 10x squared plus 6x plus 1. I don't do square roots. That's a half a power. All right? Take derivative, set them equal to zero, and solve. So the derivative is going to be, chain rule, 1 half times, oops, hit the wrong button, all I did is that, okay, hit a one half times 10x squared plus 6x plus 1 raised to negative one half times through the inside which is 20x plus 6. I'm going to set him equal to zero and solve. Well, negative exponent puts him on the bottom, two's already on the bottom, so this is 20x plus 6 over 2 times the square root of 10x squared plus 6x uh, plus 1 equals zero. Negative exponent goes on the bottom, a half a power is a square root, the two is already on the bottom. I want to solve this guy. How do you solve it when you have a fraction equal to zero? You want to multiply both sides by the common only denominator. You're going to get rid of fractions. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the square root of you know, two times the square root of 10x squared plus 6x plus 1. Two times the square root of 10x squared plus 6x plus 1. This will cancel. And when, again, what I'm trying to do with you guys is I don't skip any steps. You guys won't miss this thing. So this gives me 20x plus 6 equals what? Zero times anybody. Still zero. So it's just like saying numerator equals zero. Solving for x, subtract 6. I get 20x equals negative 6. Divide by 20. This gives me x is equal to negative 6 over 20. Always reduce fractions. What is negative 6 divided by 20 is going to be negative, negative 3 over 10. So the answer is x equals negative 3 over 10. But for those people who love their calculator, what is that also known as? Negative 0.3. We would have taken just about anything there. All right. So there you go. And I'm showing my work. I'm following this. And I've determined the x value. I took my derivative set equals 0 and I solved for x. And then, you remember my steps of optimization? What do we always do? The last step of any kind of optimization problem. Go back and answer the question. What's the question here? The question is this. Slide it up here. If the point x, y is on the line, then what is the y value of the uh, coordinate? So, what am I going to do? I got y equals 3x plus 1. And I notice that x happens to be... Uh, negative 3 tenths or 0.3 if you negative 0.3 if you want to use that what am I going to do plug it in y equals 3 times negative 3 tenths plus 1 uh, that's going to give you negative 9 tenths plus 1 what is negative 9 tenths plus 1 1 tenth so the answer is y equals 1 tenth or 0.1 for those people who love decimals we would have taken either one. Does that make sense? On this problem, the majority of the students that screwed this thing up, screwed it up through frustration. They didn't like the problem being laid out to part A do this, part B do this, so you can get in. They were trying to help you out, and the students who messed up this problem pretty much left it blank off of frustration. 
Why? Because with so much directions, they got confused. They just didn't read it. They're uh, panicking because of this final exam and their life depending on it and they're thinking about jumping out of buildings or something or other. I have no idea. But what they did was this. They left it blank. And it was so easy. But, like I said before, what they, if you get in trouble on a problem like this because you hate them giving you these steps that you don't typically follow, like your teacher didn't teach you this way or whatever, fine. It's okay. Take the original question. If I had just forget A, B, C, D, whatever, if I said this problem, find the x, y coordinate that, uh, that lies on the, uh, on the line, y equals 3x plus 1, that is closest to the origin, you know this is a chapter 4 point, whatever, 6, 4.5 section problem. Closest means minimize distance. Take yourself over here to the corner of the paper and just start working it out and to get the answer. And then go back and see if you can't just put some arrows to be there and figure out which parts that they want the answers to. You would have gotten majority credit even if you did that and didn't even put the answer there. If you had the final answer at the end, they could have came back over here and saw your work and stuff. But they're trying to help you out. And also, this is like a 10-point problem on the final exam. So it's worth a lot of points here. We try to break it up a little bit so that you got you know two points for doing this, two points for doing this. So we're kind of helping ourselves out so we can figure out a good strategy on grading it. That's why it's done this way. Does that make sense? Let's take a look at number two. All right, number two is the classic graph. And again, a lot of people missed this one up because of not sure what they were actually looking for and stuff. All right, suppose. They love the graph, I, I, this visual perspective of this stuff. All right, so let me blow it up a little bit. It says this. Suppose that the graph y equals f prime of x is shown below. So I know that this is the derivative graph. All right? Note, this is the derivative. Part A. Given y, um, excuse me, f of 0 equals 0, can you give a general sketch of y equals f of x? What this thing is going to look like? Sure. So I'm going to graph. What did they tell me? They told me one thing. What did they tell me? f of 0 equals 0. What does that mean? That's the origin. x equals 0, y equals 0. I know I'm going through the origin. All right, so let's analyze this guy. Remember, this is the derivative. Look at it from a derivative perspective. First off, we're going to look at where the derivative is positive versus negative. On this particular problem, the derivative is positive just about everywhere. How do I know the derivative is positive? Positive because this is the y-axis type of thing here, and the derivative, I don't care what value of x you tell me, is always above the y-axis. Being above the y-axis, and I'm going to write this down for your benefit, the derivative above y-axis, excuse me, well, x-axis, my fault's on words there, the derivative, well, f prime of x, above x-axis means f prime of x is greater than zero. The y-coordinates are greater than zero, which means I'm doing what in the entire problem here? What does it, what does it, what does it mean for f prime of x to be greater than zero? I'm increasing except for one point. There is one point where the derivative is equal to zero at. Where's that at? Where's the derivative equal to zero at? That's when you cross the x-axis. That's actually at the x-coordinate. So I have a uh, basically one point where the derivative is equal to zero. And it's at zero, but basically and from a number line perspective, I got zero, but I'm the derivative is increasing. This is f prime of x. It's increasing. I stop at 0, and then I increase some more. So I've got to go up. Remember, I've got to go through the origin here. So I've got to go up, stop for a second, go up some more. I'm going to lightly draw that in there. I'm going to go up, hit 0, and go up some more. Does that make sense? And I've, you, hopefully you can barely see this thing because it's not my full graph yet. Now let's talk about concavity, the units of this particular graph. What is concavity? Concavity is the second derivative, right? That is the derivative of the derivative. So if I look at this thing from a concavity perspective, concavity, I'm going to look at the second derivative. And the second derivative is the derivative derivative. So let's look at the derivative of this thing. What is the derivative of this thing? Well, what kind of slope do I have on this side? It's decreasing. 
So f double prime of x is less than zero because it's decreasing <coughs> between uh, negative infinity or whatever it is up to zero. What kind of um, slope do I have on this side? What kind of slope is this? Increasing. It's increasing. So f double prime of x is actually greater than zero from zero to infinity because I'm my slopes are going up. Does that make sense? So I've got to be I've got to increase the whole way except for right here. I've got to be I have a little horizontal tangent line thing going on at zero, and then I got to make sure that I am decreasing. I'm going to be concave down, concave down for zero to infinity. So for this one, I'm going to be concave down. So I'm going to do that. And for x is, uh, for x is from zero to infinity, I've got to be concave up. Got to do that. And that's actually what my picture looks like. Does that make sense? Looking at it from the derivative and the secondary, which is the derivative perspective, and trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. It's a game. Does that make sense? But now, they also want you to, all right, this next one down here. Sketch the graph of y, uh, f double prime, the second derivative. So this is f, the original graph, f of x. This will be f double prime of x. Now, to analyze f double prime of x, you want to analyze, go back to this original one, and then once again, analyze the derivative of this graph. At the origin, what is the derivative at the origin? Well, the, the derivative graph crosses the x-axis. It touches it. it. It's at zero. So I know that the second derivative, all right, this derivative is equal to zero, right? So I know at zero, that's where my derivative is equal to zero at, and I happen to be concave what? Concave up, all right? So I'm looking at it from a derivative perspective. Let's just start over here, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The derivative. What's the derivative of this guy? We're talking about second derivative. Derivative of this guy, I am decreasing, all right? So I am decreasing. Decreasing, like I said, is the second derivative is negative. Does that make sense? The second derivative is negative. Negative means I'm below the x-axis. Negative means, so f double prime of x is less than zero from negative infinity to zero. And to be f double prime of x to be, in terms of graph, that means I've got to be below x-axis. So I'm going to be down here someplace. Okay? But you'll notice the derivative right here. Look at the derivative. It is a minimum point. That's where the derivative is equal to zero at. So I know I'm going to go through the origin. Because my derivative, the derivative of this guy, is zero because it's a, it's a min point. So I know I've got to go through the origin. All right? But let's take a look at this thing over here. Talk about the derivative. What is the derivative of this, guy, this part right through here? What do we got? It's positive. It's increasing. But then what does it do? It seems to be leveling off a little bit, right? So I've got to be positive and level off. But first off, what is this point right here? What is the slope of the tangent line right there? Zero. So right about at that point, which is about three, I'm going to have to go back to zero again. So, but over here it's positive, so it's got to go up. Positive means, so f double prime of x is greater than zero, which means it is above, above x-axis from zero to infinity. But as I get closer to infinity, it's horizontaling out, which means I'm getting closer back to the zero. And I'm not sure what it does beyond that. It may drop or may go up, so I'm going to kind of stop over here. But it's got to be positive above the x-axis, but at three, I can be back at zero again. And then if it dips down, it may drop down below it or something like that. But, oh, sorry, there. So this will be my pretty much my graph, and I'm not sure what it does over here, but it continues to level off or drop back down so I can adjust that. But that is what we're looking for in terms of that's the graph for the second derivative. Does that make sense? Did I lose you guys anywhere? It's analyzing the slopes and the concavity, and you have to think derivative of the derivative. So if this is the first derivative, when I analyze the slopes of it, I'm looking at the second derivative. This is slope negative, so it's below. I don't know, because the graph kind of stops at 3. Does it go on? Does it drop down? Does it shoot back up? I don't know. I don't know what blows between negative 3. I'm not sure what it does over on that side. I'm not sure what it does below 3, above 3. So we're looking at within this interval. Does that make sense?
But All right. does it say it's zero? So shouldn't it just be parallel in the um, axis? Uh, does it say that? Where does it say that at? All it did was it said, notice the derivative, and it just kind of stops. And does it level off or does it drop? I can't tell. It looks kind of like it may drop a little bit to me. That's why I dropped it just below this thing just a little bit because it looked like it dropped slightly. And going down means it's below the x-axis. But anything close, we were if you just if you leveled it off there, okay. If you dropped it below, fine. We were we we were looking pretty much within this interval. Is what we're looking for. What a surprise! Another word problem. You're going to see lots of those on the old free response stuff here. Okay, what about the other side of the uh, graph? The other side of the graph. I don't know. Oh, you're talking about this problem here. Again, I don't know. Tendency seems that it's going to continue to go up. Uh, I mean, it goes this way, which means if I look at it from left to right, it's dropping, right? Which means it's negative. So that's why I put the arrow down there. But isn't it constant? It's a constant slope, though. Yes, but I don't know what over here. I could have dropped it down some more. No, My picture is only between. Is on the same number? Uh, well, no. It's it's kind of a constant, and it's a constant negative slope. So. And as this thing comes in here and does that, but you're right, it's, it's beginning to horizontal out a little bit, and that's what okay. I'm trying to draw. It is going straight out, but beyond negative three, I don't know what it's doing. Okay. Word problem. What kind of problem is this guy? Well, my students would know this better as the Sparky problem. All right, because we have the classic ladder, and somebody's pulling the bottom of the ladder and watch you fall off the top of the ladder. A 25-foot ladder rests against a vertical wall. The y is the distance between the top of the ladder and the ground, and let x be the distance between the bottom of the ladder and the wall. And they labeled it nicely, so we're all using the same letters here. All right, and the one thing you should notice is this. The ladder is fixed. So the ladder is 25 feet. That's a constant. That's not going to change, okay? If the bottom of the ladder slides away from the wall at a constant rate of 3 feet per second, so the bottom of the ladder, which would be right here, so I'm going to kind of draw this thing to be a ladder so you guys can see it. There's my ladder. And the bottom of the ladder right here is going away from the wall at 3 feet per second, right? First off, that is a rate, 3 feet per second, so you know this is a related rate problem. But you also have to identify what variable this dude is. What variable is this guy? 3 feet per second. This is in the x direction, so this would be dx dt, because it's going in the x direction. Does that make sense? Okay. How fast is the top of the, bottom, uh, top of the ladder sliding down the wall when the ladder is 16 feet from when the bottom of the ladder is 16 feet from the wall? So what am I looking for in this problem? I'm looking, this thing's going to be, if, this, if you pull out the bottom of the ladder, the classic Sparky problem with the, the, the fire engine problem we did in class, if you pull out the bottom of the ladder, the top of the ladder is going to do what? Slide. Slide down. So I'm going to be going down. So it's going down. That's a rate. So what am I looking for? It's in the y direction. So my question is going to be, what is dy dt on this problem? Does that make sense? And I'm really supposed to find dy over dt equals what? When what? When the bottom of the ladder, and the bottom of the ladder variable is what? X is 16, 16 feet. And we'll find dy dt when x equals 16. But, once again, they're going to try to help you out by giving you guys some steps. Sometimes, if you go back and look at other final exams, they, in other final exams, they drew this picture and just gave you that and said, find dy dt, basically, and let you have at it. But, in other exams, they have tried to, and it depends on who makes up the exam. There's a committee that makes up this thing, so every semester it changes. But this particular semester, they tried to help you out by um, basically giving you guys steps. So the steps are this. Step one, the first thing I've got to do is I've got to come up with an equation that uses all my variables in this situation. What do you see in this picture? I see a right triangle, right? Clearly it's a right triangle. What major theorem that deals with all the sides of a right triangle? Pythagorean theorem. Look at part A. The triangle above is a right triangle. There you go. Express the length of the ladder in terms of x and y. Well, it's a Pythagorean theorem. It's a tri and we're talking about the sides of a triangle. What's the Pythagorean theorem? A squared plus b squared equals c squared. The sum of squares of the sides of a right triangle is squared. The hypotenuse 
whatever you, however you have it memorized, but in terms of my form, it will be x squared plus y squared equals what? 25 squared. The latter doesn't move. That's where a lot of people screw this problem up at. They call this thing L for ladder or D for distance or something like that and set it equal to D squared. And that's wrong because D is a constant. And being a constant, you want to plug that into your formula. It's not, it's not going to vary. Does that make sense? There's the answer for part A. There's three more points on the old final exam. All right, here we go, part B. Now, differentiate the expression in part A with respect to time because we're trying to find this dy dt. So once you get your equation, you jump in with both feet and take derivative with respect to time. So what's the derivative of x squared? 2x what? dx dt. You're taking derivative with respect to time. So every time you take a derivative of a variable, times d variable dt. Plus, what's the derivative of y squared? 2y dy dt equals, what is the derivative of 25 squared? Zero, because it's a constant. Again, that messed up some people. They wrote 50. You know why? What's the derivative of 25 squared? Clearly, you bring the 2 out front, and then 2 times 25 is 50, and they just failed the problem. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Again, I'm trying to remind, I'm, what I'm trying to do is also show you places where other students make mistakes. Careless error type thing, because you're not thinking. All right. Now, what is the value of dx dt? This, to me, was not worth any points at all, but yet we made it worth one point because students were just having a tough time on this one. Again, if you ever get into trouble with a problem like this and they're doing all the parts on trying to fill out the parts, just forget this mess. Do the question. Write it down here. Do all the parts. And then try to go back and figure out the blanks. And you'll still get the right answer. Okay, do it your, your natural way and then go back and answer their questions. But they are trying to help you out. But this one is kind of strange here. What is the value of dx dt? And then they wrote, if you don't know, please read the problem again. What was dx dt? Oh, yeah, we were pulling the bottom of the ladder out. And we even said, what's dx dt? Yep, you got a point for doing this. dx over dt equals 3 feet per second. Yep, there it is. Okay, now, they were trying to emphasize this is a related rate. So what is the value of y when x equals 16? So this is the problem is this. If I start plugging in my numbers here, I got 2, I got x is 16, I got dx dt plus 2. I'm looking for dy dt. I need to figure out what y is. That's the part I don't know. When you don't know something or other, always go back to the original equation. My original equation was x squared plus y squared equals 25 squared. <coughs> x is 16. We want to figure out what y is. So I'm going to plug it in. 16 squared plus y squared equals 25 squared. 16 squared is, time for calculator again, 16 squared is 256 plus y squared equals 25 squared. That's uh, 625. Solving for y squared, subtract 256 from both sides y squared is equal to 625 minus 256, 369. And what do you got to do to actually solve for y? Square root of both sides. So y would be equal to the square root of 369. What is that? That is a distance, and distance is measured in feet. Don't forget your units. And for those people who just love decimals, we don't care. We would have accepted that too. The square root of 369 is, and for those people, 19.20937271 feet. Uh, we've also accepted either one of these two things. And there's the answer to that problem. Now, you're supposed to put it all together and figure out what dy dt is. Remember this, 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt is equal to zero. Now go back and plug it all in. 2 times x. What was x equal to? x was 16 in this problem. This way up here was given to be 16. Also up here they're telling you once again x is 16. 16 times what was dx dt? 3 feet per second plus 2. We figured out what y is. I'm going to use the old square root of 369 to use the calculator. Times dy over dt equals 0. Watch this, because this is also a couple, you lost a point or two off of the final exam because of this. Solving this guy. What is 2 times 3 times 16 is 96. 
So this is 96 plus 2 square roots of 369 dy over dt equals 0. How do I solve for dy dt? I'm going to subtract 96, and let's think about that in a second, but subtract 96. This is going to give me 2 square roots of 369 dy dt equals negative 96. And then what am I going to do? Divide by 2 square roots of 369. 2 square roots of 369. This gives me dy over dt is equal to negative, and you can clean this guy up, 96 divided by 2 is uh, 48. 48 over the square root of 369. Or, I mean, clearly I have a bunch of engineering majors in my classes. Uh, they want decimals just to make sense out of it. So fine, we would have taken that. Negative 48 divided by the square root of 369 is negative 2.498780019. Don't forget this. What? Feet per second. It is a rate. Don't forget that. That's worth a point or two. You've got to have your units. And also notice, some people lost another point on this one. Why negative? What is the negative telling me in this problem? It's going down the wall. Does that make sense? It's negative, so it's going down. Up and away is positive. Down and left is negative. Question? Could you round it up to 2.5 negative for a uh, I would at least take it out three or four decimal places. Don't just one decimal place is bad. Give them, give them a few more. I use calculator, hence I get them all out. Okay? So... But the key to it is, don't forget the negative. Negative means it's going down, and don't forget the units. All right. Here we go, number four. It says this. You know they're going to throw this problem at you somewhere on the test. This is basically uh, the beginning of real calculus was limits and the definition of derivative. Make sure you know all versions. There's two or three versions of the definition of derivative. Make sure you know these guys. Here we go. Well, F, I got a function here. F of x equals uh, 3x squared plus 2x. Use the definition of derivative. And they even gave it to you, but I can't guarantee that. Sometimes... They're just going to say, use the definition of derivative, and they're going to expect you guys to know what it is. They were very nice on this test. They gave you the definition of derivative. F prime of A equals lemma as H goes to 0, F of A plus H minus F of A over H. To evaluate F prime of 2. All right? So basically, F prime of 2 is equal to the limit as H goes to 0. A is my 2 here, so it'll be F of 2 plus H minus F of 2 all over H. Okay? Now, here's the deal. Definition of derivative stuff here. Plug this stuff in. I'm plugging in 2 plus h into my x. This will give me 3 times 2 plus h quantity squared plus 2 times 2 plus h. Put parentheses around it. Minus f of 2. f of 2 would be plugging 2 into this guy. 3 times 2 squared plus 2 times 2 all over h, and of course, don't forget to write the limit as h approaches 0, showing your work on all this good stuff. Now, this is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of, I want to clean this guy up. This is just 3 times 2 plus h squared plus 2 times 2 plus h minus, this is nothing but a number. Really don't need a calculator for this. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. 12 plus 4 is... 16, all over H. Hey, darling. Equals, ladies and gentlemen, my daughter, Isabella Mary Taylor. Everybody calls her Bella. <laughs> also, by the way, it's Desiree's daughter, too, in case you wanted to know. But okay, there you go. All right, so, but I'm proud of her, so I, today I'm going to claim her as mine. All right. Now, how am I going to clean this guy up? So, what am I going to do to clean this guy up now? What, what am I going to do? How do I clean this guy up? What am I going to do? it. This will be the limit as h goes to 0 of 3 times folding this guy out. This will be 4 plus 4h plus h squared. This guy I'm going to distribute plus 4 plus 4h minus 16 all over h. 
Again, I'm going out of my way not to skip steps. This is what they wanted to see on this problem. This is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 12 plus 12h plus 3h squared plus 4 plus 4h minus 16. Uh, what did I do there? 2h. Oh, excuse me. You're right. That's, a, that's my typo there. Thank you. 2, and that should be a 2 there. 2h. When I distribute, 2 times 2 is 4. That's 4h. And uh, 2 times h is a 2h. You're correct. 2h. And this is 4 plus 2h minus 16. All over h. Combine like terms. This is the limit as h approaches 0 of... Well, you're going to make it tough on me, aren't you? <laughs> that's fine. Hey, sweetie. All right. This is equal to... What is six, uh, 12 of plus 4? 12 plus 4 is? 16 minus 16 is? 0. That cancels out. What is 12H plus 2H? 14H. Give me some help, guys. Plus 3H squared all over H. Does that make sense? What do you have in common on this numerator? Factor it out. You're left with 14 plus 3H over H. This cancels. This leaves me with the limit as h goes to 0 of 14 plus 3h. You with me so far? Now, what's the last thing you guys do with limits? Plug in your number, in this case 0 for h. And so this thing goes to 0, so what do I get? 14. The answer to this problem is 14. In other words, f prime of 2 equals 14. But this is showing you work. Now, here's the sad thing. Double check your answer. Because we all make careless errors and look there, I almost made one myself without some help and I appreciate that. But the fact of the matter is, double check your stuff. What do they ask me to do? Find out a problem of two. Can't you just kind of come over here and kind of double check your answer because you learned all this calculus, use it. What is the derivative of this function? Don't hurt yourselves, what is it? Six. Pretty much. 6x plus 2. And what do we want to find? f prime of 2, which is 6 times 2 plus 2. What's that? What's 6 times 2? Plus 2. Yep, I got it right. 14, it checks. But this is the work. The amazing thing to us that we're on this interesting committee that was grading this stuff was this. It says, use the definition of derivative. And we had quite a few students just do this. And you understand this was like worth uh, five, six points on the final exam. How many points do you think they got? Zero. Because, man, we, we can all do this. And it's a good thing to check it. But what did it ask me to do? Use the definition of derivative to do this thing. All right? So pay attention to directions, especially on this kind of problem. They love this problem. It goes back and reminds yourself of how this stuff was developed. Now, it's amazing to me, B and um, B part one and two, a lot of people died on them. They just left it blank because they didn't know what to do. So take a look at this guy here. It's a completely different problem. They said the expression, the limit as h approaches 0 of 3e, excuse me, e raised to the 3 times 1 plus h minus e cubed divided by h represents uh, f prime of a for some function um, f and some point a. a, a. Find the formula for the function f of x such that f prime of x equals the limit as h approaches 0 of e to the um, 3 times 1 plus h minus e cubed divided by h. So they didn't know what to do. And I want to remind you of the formulas uh, that you are supposed to know when it comes to these definition of derivative stuff. And I wrote them down over here just to remind myself. But here we go. First off, you got this guy. f prime of a is equal to f of a, and the limit is h goes to 0, of course, of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. There's one formula. The other formula for the actual full derivative is the limit as h approaches <coughs> 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And there was one other formula you were supposed to remember from basically chapter 2.1, 2.2 stuff, which is this. Another version of f prime of a is the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. So there are actually three versions of the derivative here. 
two, one, of, one of them is the derivative uh, function. The other two is derivative evaluated at a point. There are three formulas here. Which one are they using on this guy? They're actually using the first one, which is the one they gave you in part one, by the way. They wrote down the formula for you. So here's the deal. A plus H. This is F of A plus H. So I got this A plus H. It looks like 1 plus 3. So 1, I'm sorry, 1 plus H. 1 plus H has to be A plus H. What is that telling me A has to be equal to? If 1 plus H equals A plus H, what's A? 1. So this is actually the definition right here. This guy is F prime of 1. Does that make sense? F prime of 1, and this is A plus H, and we want to know what F of X is. So you're going to replace this 1 plus, or A plus H, or the 1 plus H with X, and that's going to give you what the function is. So what is my function on this problem? You got it. The answer was E to the 3X. That's what they were looking for. That must have been what the function is. And it's understanding the relationship between this stuff and how the limit's written and actually what the function is. Does that make sense? No. Questions? Now, the second part is this. What is the number that is A? Well, I've already done that one. What was the A value in this limit as H goes 0? 3, I'm sorry, E raised to 3 times 1 plus H minus E cubed divided by H. What is A? You got it. And there wasn't much to show. It's more of a comparison to the formula and just pulling off the, the information. Does that make sense? But do you know that I would say 40% of the folks that took this exam left this two, the last two parts of this thing blank because they didn't know what to do. And it was basically, it was detective work on understanding the derivative formulas and writing down what the function is. Hey, sweetie. All right. Last one. Then I'm going to go get this one some lunch. All right. So here we go. Number five. Oh, what a surprise. Another word problem. And we already had the related rate word problem, and we had one optimization word problem. So the last word problem is going to be, I don't know, one or the other. This one is what kind of problem? A box with a square base and an open top must have a volume of 5,000 cubic inches. We wish to find the dimension of the box that minimize the amount of material. This is the same as minimizing the surface area of the box. All right? They want us to minimize surface area. Max min problem, clearly an optimization problem. Okay, so here we go. And again, they gave me steps on this guy on what to do, but let's see if we can't do it all up here and then fill out the blanks. I can show you that's, that concept still works. What do they want me to do? All right, step number one. What do they want us to do? They want us to minimize something or other. What do they want to minimize? Minimize amount of material. We need the objective equation. What is the objective equation? The objective equation is to minimize surface area, the amount of material. We have an open top. So the surface area formula is equal to, it's the area of all the surfaces. What's the area of the bottom down here? Length times width, it's x squared. Plus, what's the, length, uh, what's the area of one of the sides over here? x, y. But how many sides do I have looking just like this one? One, two, three, four. Side, side, front, and back, there are four of those. It's an open top, so there is nothing in the top. Does that make sense? That is my surface area equation. Now. That's the guy we want to take rid of, set him equal to zero, and solve. We got a problem. You know what my problem is? Too many letters. Standard problem. So I need to come up with the constraint equation. What is the constraint equation? That's the equation with the given information. What did they give me? They gave me a volume of 5,000. So volume is equal to 5,000 inches cubed. What is the volume of a box? Length times width times height, or? Volume equals x times x times y, x squared times y, and that's got to be 5,000. Use the constraint equation to solve for y. Solve for one of the variables. Obviously, y is the easiest thing to solve for. So y is going to be equal to 5,000 over x squared. And I'm going to take this guy and plug him right in here. Does that make sense? This is going to give me the surface area, which would be x squared plus 4x times y, which is 5,000 over x squared. Okay, clean them up. Surface area is equal to x squared plus 4 times 5,000. What is that? Don't hurt yourselves. 4 times 5, 20,000. 20, Thank you. 
20,000. Don't need a calculator for that. X divided by X squared is over X. There's my dude right there. And I'm going to highlight him. He is my surface area equation in terms of one variable, X. I want to minimize this guy. Anytime you need to maximize or minimize, what are you going to do? Take derivative, set him equal to 0, and solve. All right? So before I take derivative of this guy, I'm going to clean him up one more time. This is X squared plus 20,000 X to the negative 1. The derivative is going to be 2X and 20,000 is a constant, leave it alone. Derivative of x to negative 1 is minus negative 1 times 20,000, which is negative 20,000. x to the negative 2. Set him equal to 0 and solve. Does that make sense? Solving this guy, this is 2x will be equal to, moving this to the other side, I would add 20,000 x to negative 2, which gives me uh, 2x equals 20,000. And x to negative 2, where's that x to the negative 2, where's that x go? On the bottom it becomes an x squared. There's my dude. I'm going to solve for x. I'm going to multiply both sides by x squared. That'll give me 2x cubed equals 20,000 because the x squared would have canceled there. And divide by 2. This is going to give me x cubed is equal to 20,000 divided by 2 is, last time I checked, 10,000. Now what kills off a cube? Take the cube root of both sides. So x is equal to, what is the cube root of 10,000? Well, if you don't remember where your cube root button is, that's okay. You can just take the 10,000, and instead of cube root, is the same thing as raising them to the one-third. Don't forget to put parentheses around it, one-third power. And I get, oh, I'm sorry, crappy numbers, that's why. 21.5443469. Um, well, what is this unit? Uh, this is in inches, inches. Okay, so there's my answer right there. Does that make sense? But now, go back and answer the question. All right, so now I've got my answer. I know what X is going to be, and I'm going to go back and go answer their questions. Look at part A. I've got everything. All i got to do is go up here and figure out what my parts are. Part A was this. Write an equation that relates to 5,000 cubic inch volume in terms of variables of X and Y in the diagram above. What was the equation that was 5,000? What was that? In uh, cubic inches. That was the volume equation, right? So what was that one? That was this equation right here. What is it? X squared times Y equals 5,000. That was my volume. Length times width times height equals 5,000. That is the answer for this guy. Yes? If we wrote Y equals 5,000 over X squared. We would take that too. We would, or, I'll put that at Y, or Y equals 5,000 over x squared. We would have taken either one of those. Okay? It's, it's an equation that relates the x and y with the volume. Alright? Part B. What is it asking for? Write an equation expressing surface area of the box in terms of x and y. What was my surface area equation? That was the first thing I did on this problem. What was it? x squared plus 20,000. Might as well clean them up. Over x. It was this guy here. There's my surface area in terms of that one variable x. But they want x and y. Oh, wait a minute. They want x and y. I'm sorry. I need this guy here. Let me rewrite that one. So I should have used y out. Okay, so this is 4. They want x and y. I'm sorry. I should have read the problem. 4 times x times y. I do like uh, you guys do me all the time. Here you go. Can you guys read that? A surface area equals x squared plus 4xy. That is what the surface area equation in terms of x and y. Now you're supposed to do what? Which is what we did. Use the answer in part A to eliminate one of the variables in part B and determine the dimensions. Ah, they want the dimensions. That was what I was all after. So we have all my work, and I can do this. Work is over here, because I've got it all right here. What was the answer for X? 21 point, what was it? 5, 4, 4, 3, 4, Sorry, three, four, uh, six, nine inches. And the dimensions are x by y, x by x by y. So what, how am I going to figure out what the y is? Well, y was equal to 5,000 over x squared. So this is 5,000 over 21.5443469 squared. And so I'm going to put that on my calculator. And I get... 
772-17345 inches. And that is my answer at minimize. Does that make sense? And again, my point to this problem and the way that I did it was if you don't like the steps that are giving you to try to help you out, well, then do the problem on your own and go back and then try to, quote, put the spots of what you've got into the blank. Do not let this be the only file exam you guys look at. Uh, you should go back and look at previous file exams. They're very important for you guys. Study older file exams. My question is, did you guys think this final exam was overly difficult? No. no. And your final exam won't be either, but people threw a fit about this step things, and when people got frustrated, what they ended up doing was leaving this stuff blank. They just left it blank and just lost all the points on it. You know something, always write something out on this stuff. I'll be posting this video a little bit later. Study hard on this thing, and I'll see you guys at 7.30 in the morning. Um, I mean, All right, my guys. Um, I put your, um, let's see.